Hello everyone and welcome to Virginia International University's MBA 536 Labor Relations class. With this section we're going to pick up uh, on Chapter 6 and we're going to deal with the idea of an impasse. And so during our first discussion in Chapter 6 we talked about the bargaining process and we talked that um, at a certain point in time we would reach, we need to reach a tentative agreement that needs to be ratified by union membership that then needs to be put in writing and signed. However, to get to that tentative agreement, we may have to work through this idea of a um, impasse, right, where we cannot reach agreement. And so that's what we want to talk about a little bit in this section. And so no matter what the method of negotiations, the parties at some point may reach this, uh, um, may fail to reach an agreement or uh, get to this point of an impasse or a stalemate. And there are many reasons why um, negotiations could result in this impasse. And, and the most obvious, obviously, is that the interests of the two parties haven't been reconciled. Another reason is that one party has no real intentions of settling, right? So it's really not um, good faith bargaining. Their overall strategy might include going to an impasse to show how inflexible the other party is. Also, during pressure bargaining, a strategic impasse may appear necessary to move the two parties to close, closer together, and a genuine impasse results simply by miscalculating how close the parties really are. So then we say, well, what are the options that are available to us if we have an impasse? And obviously that's third party intervention, such as um, you know, uh, a mediator or an arbitrator. We could continue the contract on a day-to-day -day basis so that management doesn't suffer and workers continue to get paid and have a job to go to. You could have a lockout, which is um, what is a stage by the employer whereby union members are simply not allowed to go back to work. Or you could have a strike, which is a work stoppage by a number of employees um, caused by this disagreement, stalemate, or impasse with management over certain issues, such as contract negotiations negotiations or unfair labor practices. And so this um, idea or right to strike is one of the rights made available to employees and it is expressly provided for by the National Labor Relations Act and lies at the core of congressional intent to promote collective bargaining in the private sector. Usually but not always in the public sector employees are banned uh, from striking by law. So whatever the reason for an impasse is, the decision to strike is an important decision. In many instances, the union negotiating team has asked members to support a strike both early in the negotiating process just to prove its bargaining power when it becomes necessary to apply pressure. Although it is noted that, um, you know, uh, by the former president of the United Auto Workers that nobody wins in a strike, but there comes a point in time when somebody can push you off the cliff. And so it's important also to note here that, um, you know, a strike means a loss of wages and benefits, especially health insurance. Strikers are not entitled to food stamps, although often what we'll see happen is that, um, you know, stores or provisions are set up in a common area and it may be set up by affiliated unions or national unions that are um, assisting at the local level where, um, you know, um, either whether it's medical supplies or food and provisions are brought in for striking workers. And we also note that replacement workers may be hired. So management could decide in a strike to uh, go out and hire replacement workers. And so this graph just gives us an indication of the number of strikes involving a thousand workers or more over the time period indicated across the bottom of the page. So the number of major U.S. strikes has remained remarkably low in recent years. And we think that's that concern about loss of wages and potential permanent loss of jobs are reasons why fewer union members and leaders are calling, are willing to call for a strike. Employers have demonstrated their willingness to hire and retrain replacement workers to help defeat a strike. And then finally, um, finding qualified replacement workers is just not as difficult as it is in the past. However, you know, uh, both management and union membership realizes that a strike isn't in either party's best interest.
So the tool that management has, obviously, in response to a strike is to, one, anticipate that the union could call for a strike. And in that event, management should have a strike plan. And they often focus on how the employer will shut down operations during the strike. They will focus on how to, perhaps, how to continue to operate with only management personnel. So, you know, in that case, we see management going out on the shop floor and running the equipment or providing, you know, whatever the service or product is. Or we see another aspect to the plan, one as being hiring replacement workers. And, um, we, we know that, um, strikers may not be fired during the strike, but they can be replaced with permanent replacement workers. Employers may not large, I'm sorry, lawfully discharge a striking worker until they have hired a replacement worker to fill the position. And so it's also um, necessary that both management and unions um, uh, pre uh, understand the implications of, of what a strike would happen when a strike might happen. So it boils down to, well, when might we expect to predict a strike? And there we see here multiple causes of strikes that make them difficult to predict. So what is the state of the economy and political forces, right? Are the political forces pro or anti-union? Is the economy a strong, strong economy whereby there is a low unemployment rate, so workers are hard to find, which would make the, you know, the threat to management of a strike more important? Um, is there, we talk about the failure of the parties to correctly estimate the other party's level of interest in critical factors. We talk about just the cost of strike, and so that's from a management perspective and from union membership's perspective. And then we have to look at the benefits stemming from a strike to, to try to understand whether it would be in either party's best interest should a strike happen. What, you know, is the issue important enough? to put it to the test of whether it could cause a, the call for a strike or not. And so we look at then, if there are strikes, what are some of the reasons for one? Um, and we really think about this and talk about them within three basic models. The first is the accidental model. And that suggests that negotiators, and those are both union and management, have acted rationally during the negotiation and have have substantial incentives to avoid strike, and so they seek to reach an agreement without involving a strike. But strikes happen, um, and so we can say that those strikes would happen only uh, because of uh, bargaining errors such as unrealistic expectations by the union or management leadership, misperception of bargaining goals, or a substantial difference between union negotiators and rank and file membership. The next theory focuses on a joint on joint strike costs and suggest that strikes are more likely to occur when the joint cost to management and the union are relatively low. Uh, so for example, when management has substantial inventories and um, the um, you know and can use management or other personnel to keep operating for a substantial period of time without union members. And then finally we talk about rational uh, tactics and that's um, where in the bargaining process uh, we they um, generally occur when two parties have substantially different information. So, for example, a firm with a low ability to pay higher wages and remain solvent may have an incentive to endure a lengthy strike and convince the union of its financial condition. Research on strikes in the manufacturing industries for an 18-year period revealed that strikes were most often uh, resulting from bargaining errors or the accidental model. We did find other um, strikes under the other two models, however, they um, weren't as uh, numerous as under the accidental model, or couldn't be explained as well as uh, the accidental model. And so then we talk about the types of strikes that are involved, and we talk in terms of a primary strike, where that's really a strike between the employer and the employees. And within the uh, uh, strikes, primary strikes, there's the economic strike, which is called to affect economic settlement of the negotiation, or could also be an unfair labor practice strike, which is called to protest an employer's violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Then we have this idea of a rolling strike. And this is a strike technique used by unions that moves a strike against an employer from one location to another location so that hiring replacement workers becomes more difficult. 
and we see here that the location can change daily. So again, um, you know, the location, however, can change daily, making hiring replacements or covering locations with management nearly impossible. For example, um, you know, in the, uh, the 2005 baggage handlers and loaders represented by the Transport and General Workers Union staged a one-day strike at Heathrow Airport in London, England, which stranded about 70,000 summer travelers. The walkout was to demonstrate support for workers fired by the airport catering firm and represented by the same union. And so under this idea of a permanent striker replacement, what happens is that the worker, workers have called a strike. So management has decided that, well, we're going to hire replacement workers for them. And sometimes this gets very ugly because essentially replacement workers are crossing a picket line or a strike line. And it, these situations can get very tenuous. Um, and often the police have to be there in order to ensure um, uh, safety and um, just peaceful demonstrations. But what, uh, even where a permanent striker is re um, replaced, the worker still retains protection under the National Labor Relations Act for both economic and unfair labor practice strikes. And then we talk about this idea of the McKay Doctrine. And what this doctrine um, does is to um, interprets, um, and it was a, a court rule, but it was interprets the National Labor Relations Act as to allow employers to replace striking workers with permanent workers unless it's determined that the strike was an unfair labor uh, strike. Striking workers who apply for reinstatement may be placed on a waiting list and hired as jobs become available. And um, the uh, McKay Doctrine has been somewhat limited by three national labor relations decisions that say, one, employers cannot permanently replace strikers who are striking over an unfair labor practice. Secondly, strikers who apply for reinstatement unconditionally must be placed on a waiting list and hires jobs become available if they do not require other employment. And three, employers cannot grant pay raises to replacement workers not operated or offered to strikers. And so to continue on the McKay Doctrine, we say that, um, you know, employees are, um, are really entitled to their jobs back, um, they, or that it is that employers cannot permanently replace strikers if they're striking over an unfair labor practice, and that um, strikers who apply for reinstatement unconditionally must be placed on a waiting list under this McKay Doctrine and hired as jobs become available if they do not acquire other employment, and then that, um, you know, employers cannot grant pay raises to replacements that are not offered to strikers. And so there are some important provisions related to the McKay Doctrine. And so this just points to some of the um, strikes that are un undertaken by unlawful means or purposes are not legal and whereby employees can be fired. And these include a sit-down strike, where it's really the takeover, the employee, takeover of an employer's property, where they're on the employer's property and they literally sit down, lie down, strap themselves to machinery. Uh, it's, it's seen as an, this, this type of strike is illegal because it's seen as a violation of the owner's property rights. The wildcat strike is an economic strike conducted by a minority of the workers without the approval of the union and in violation of the no strike clause in existing contracts. The partial strike is um, a various types of job actions such as a work slowdown or a refusal to work overtime. And again, this is seen as a violation of the owner's property rights. And then this idea of a sick out. And um, this was um, in the, the 90s one of the fastest growing types of job operation or of job actions. And it really is an organized effort to have workers call in sick. And so again, these types of strikes are unlawful means of conducting a strike. And so the National Labor Relations Act outlaws some consequences for which workers might strike. And these include a jurisdictional strike, because, um, which is a strike called because two unions are in dispute as to whose workers deserve the work. So, for example, a, an electrical union could strike a construction site in protest of laborers being used to unload electrical supplies.
This idea of a feather bedding strike is when a union tries to pressure the employer to make work for union members through the limitation of production, increasing the amount of work to be performed, or other make work arrangements. Or we have the idea of this recognitional strike, which is a strike called to gain recognition for another union if the certified union already represents employees. And so often you'll hear this idea of picketing. Uh, and so um, th this idea of picketing is um, that you, what is created is a line or procession of union members or union supporters that are staging a public protest outside an employer concerning a labor dispute, often due to failed contract talks. And we see this often um, where, you know, outside the um, place of employment, off the employer's property, uh, you see a line of employees with signs you know, that um, kind of uh, slogans or logos that um, present their case, and it's really meant to draw public attention to the strike. Sometimes it's meant to be intimidating to the employer or to, um, you know, discredit the employer's name, but, um, but, but we do see the practice happening. And in the context of picketing, we can talk about um, craft unions where we have a small number of pickets to inform members of other craft unions that a strike is in process because, again, this is, um, you know, may, um, uh, we may find support in those other unions. Um, we may also find that uh, it, it informs these other unions that this is an issue and it's an important issue or there wouldn't be a picket or strike developed over it, which may inform them with regard to their negotiations. We also find where industrial unions may be picketing. This really then requires active and a large number of pickets, and the goal of this is really to discourage unskilled laborers from keeping production lines in uh, operation. And so during this stage of a impasse, we may also see the use of an employer lockout, although we see this less frequently than strikes. Um, and this is where the employer may withhold employment to resist union demands or actually force concessions from the union. So layoffs, shutting down facilities, or bringing in non-union workers can accomplish a um, lockout. And we see the different types of lockouts here, where it's a defensive lockout, which is really justified if a threatened strike causes unusual economic or operational difficulty. So the employer um, uh, uh, executes a lockout if, they're, if because of a strike they are threatened with unusual economic loss or operational activities. We may find uh, an offensive strike, and this is where the, or I'm sorry, an offensive lockout, which is used to end labor disputes on terms unfavorable to employers, and then we also find, you know, a provision of lockouts to be the use of replacement workers. And so most agreements in the private sector contain provisions restricting both the union's ability to call a strike and management's ability to stage a lockout. Um, under um, either, that is the um, uh, no strike clause or the no lockout clause or provision. Um, neither type of provision is negotiated because they're reciprocal in nature. No strike and no lockout clauses often contain similar, if not identical, language, which really follows in um, uh, two categories. An unconditional bans on interference with production during the life of the contract and conditional bans that permit the strike or lockout under certain circumstances except exhaustion of the gre um, um, grievance procedure, violation of the arbitration award, refusal to arbitrate a dispute or non-compliance with a portion of the agreement, or a deadlock, deadlock contract op reopener. To the discipline or discharge of employees participating in illegal strikes under a no-strike provision may be permitted in the agreement, and most of these clauses provide for appeal by the employee. Obviously, no strike clauses are usually high sought after industry, uh, but severe circumstances may alter their value. And so obviously we need to get beyond this impasse if we're going to have successful negotiations. And one way of doing that is through the use of mediation, where we 
uh, introduce a neutral third party into a grievance situation or collective bargaining impasse. Although mediators have no decision-making powers, they use their skills and work actively to achieve a settlement that is mutually agreeable to both sides. And um, you know, sometimes this idea of um, mediation is really we talk about this idea of face saving, so that the union negotiators um, are still seen uh, favorably in the eyes of the union members and management isn't seen as being weak or having yielded on all cases or all issues to the union. And so mediation or mediators will often come in and they're generally high profile individuals um, that will often come and they're neutral and they'll often come in. So uh, to get to where these um, sides really want to get to, but to do it in a way that allows both sides to save face. Then we have this idea of um, interest arbitration, right, where there's a third party and it could be a, a single individual arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators that makes the final and binding decisions on the details of the final collective bargaining agreement. Interest arbitration is a distinctly different process from mediation, right. It is a process that's used to resolve an impasse in negotiations where the parties submit the unresolved items to this neutral third party to render a binding decision. Like mediation, it uses this neutral third party, which could be an individual or a panel, but unlike mediation, the arbitrator is given the authority to make a final and binding decision regarding the unresolved items in a stalled non-contract uh, negotiation. It's also important to realize that interest arbitration is different from grievance arbitration, where we utilize arbitration to resolve rights and disputes that have arisen during the life of a contract. Labor negotiators generally prefer to use mediation in resolving a contract negotiation and impasse because they maintain control of the outcome um, and so interest arbitration is infrequently used in the private sector to resolve contract impasses. And so when we go into this arbitration um, mode there are generally three processes that happen. One is a final offer arbitration, which is a method of dispute resolution requiring both parties to submit their final offer to an unresolved issue to an arbitrator or panel that has the authority to select one of the proposals. There's mediation arbitration, which is a combination of mediation and arbitration, obviously, where the parties agree to bring in a mediator with authority to arbitrate any unresolved items. Uh, should the mediation um, which occurs first fail. And then we have this idea of fact-finding, which is really the um, semi-judicial method of dispute resolutions used primarily in the public sector. So fact-finding can be used to delay a strike, bring an unreasonable demand to the public's attention, create an atmosphere for new ideas, and if reasonable recommendations are made, or if reasonable recommendations are made, pressure a party into acceptance. This technique is used where such pressures may force the parties to reach an agreement, especially if the facts show that one side is unreasonable. And so then we want to talk a little bit about bargaining in the public sector because it's obviously distinctly different than bargaining in the private sector. And the reason that it's different is simply because of the nature of public employment versus private employment. Public employees provide essential services, right? So with public employees, we may be talking about, you know, the uh, operators of mass transit. We may be talking about uh, the uh, safety officers like the police or uh, EMT or firemen. Um, we lack controls on public service in the absence of marketplace controls on their costs. We find that it's difficult to assess the productivity of professional workforce. And we also have issues surrounding elected officials and how they represent public employers. And then there's this idea of the sovereignty document that we talked about that limits issues that are addressed by uh, the bargaining process in public employment. And so while we have a very different nature of, of services performed, we do find that the same bargaining theories and processes in the private sector apply to the public sector with little variation. It's just that the context within which, uh, you know, in some of the economic and non-economic issues uh, that are negotiated uh, and, and the context of those issues may um, very greatly. And then we have this idea of multilateral bargaining existing in two forms, and that's the council form and the executive legislature or legislature slated form.
And so when we're talking again about um, negotiating the public employee contract, we may be talking about open negotiations where um, or where press coverage may harm the negotiating process. And so it's more to each party's advantage to resolve issues. We also talk about sunshine laws that require bargaining to be open to the public and that causes press coverage to be necessary because of ultimate responsibility of, to, of the public for decisions of elected officials. And so we talk about the right to strike when we're talking about public sector bargaining. And there are some arguments that support the right to strike. And so that says, in actuality, public employees go on strike despite laws to the contrary. They just do it. And you think about it, we did uh, talk about um, you know, uh, huge amounts of employees calling in sick, right? That's one way of doing it. Strikes or credible strike threats facilitate final agreement. Right, the strike length can be used as a union bargaining strategy, and then non-essential public employees should have the same rights as private sector employees. The counter to these arguments that support the right to strike are those that oppose the right to strike, including that public employees provide essential services. So firemen can't strike because it's not in the public's uh, safety best interest in safety and they may right there should there may still be a fireman strike and what would happen there is that you know the state may have to call out its national guard to fight fires in the interim um, the other argument says that if, if public employees have the right to strike it gives the employees more power than elected officials and then finally the argument says that unions compel can compel governments to make unwise agreements that, or agreements that uh, could be construed as not being in the public's best interest So along with the, you know, the same steps uh, and it uh, become applicable in resolving an impasse in the public sector. So public sector employer may generally implement its last best offer, right? There's this idea of mediation where it's almost provided in almost all states with public sector uh, collective bargaining. We have the idea of fact finding and advisory arbitration we talked about in the private sector before, which is more effective because of political pressure. And then we have the idea of interest arbitration, where there's an arbitrator or a panel that makes a binding decision on the negotiation dispute. So most all of these um, um, methodologies to resolving an impasse in the public sector we also saw um, as being available in the private sector. So this concludes Chapter 6. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Please make sure you read the chapter closely, and if there are any questions or concerns, speak with your course facilitator. Thank you.